uh, and they each had different terms. But Instagram is coming. Reddit was announced, so that's coming even faster. So Reddit immediately, um, Snapchat, yeah, Instagram's coming. You can imagine Instagram wasn't a priority for offering management because there wasn't. It's going to look at the word context. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is still coming, but it's not a, a, a huge priority. Um, one other thing I didn't mention too is it actually will scrape uh, the comments and videos. Um, so that's another thing that's already built in here as well. Awesome. Yep. LinkedIn too, right? It's LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn too. The cool thing about this being cloud, I guess good and bad, is the, the good is that it, we keep forming partnerships with all these different providers, right? So that the LinkedIn's and the Instagram's, uh, the bad part is, it could constantly change, uh, but we only see it getting better, right? Because the more more people we, we make partnerships with, the better. But the data you're getting is anonymized, right? From the, you, you, you're well, no. If it's third party, no, it's fair game, right? So if it's public, if it's on Twitter or on Facebook, it is what it is. right? Now, remember the data you're bringing to the to the table. That's your data. That's anonymized. That's encrypted. When you upload, that's all that that's all fair and dandy. But social media is open. The idea of Watson Analytics for social media is to aggregate all that social data that is public to identify right sentiment, influencers, all that good stuff. Stuff that you could do on your own and probably Google for the. You know, someone says, "Hey, this is a badass car. That's probably a good thing, right?" As opposed to, "That's a badass car." Yeah. Yeah. That's hey, I'm ready for you. That's What's, your, a bad What's your personal email? What's that? What's your person? Uh, Wesley.strom at gmail.com. <coughs> good, good questions. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. So I can keep on moving too if we got them. Go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just yep. like the data that we're putting in ourselves. Yep. That's like stuff that we're, we're like copying and pasting from another place. Like, I'm just wondering if it, if it linked to like proprietary systems. Like, Rutgers University has like their admission system. Like, does, does it have capabilities to? Link, or does it need to be like a compatible software? We're putting it in kind of. So we're, uh, it's a great lead in. We're going to talk about the data, how I get to the data, okay. what I can use appropriately. So, you know, today I'm going to upload this, uh, I think it's, you know, this simple spreadsheet, right? But you can, uh, so I'm here in Watson Airlines, by the way, and I'm walking in. I'm at the main screen. There's three areas you want to focus on data, discovery around your data, and displaying that data, right? There's three areas. So, here on the data tab. So here I've got all this data sets that I've loaded up over time. And you can see the type CSV, most of our cell. But I also have the ability to uh, hook up the databases. And also, these are the connections I've set up for myself. So things like Dropbox and Box. Like Google Drive. Drive right? Google cool. Drive is on there. But then also, if I want to go to, if this is your allowed to, go to directly to the Rutgers Admissions database. It's something called a secure gateway. And then you have all these data connectors. Uh, close. So all these, so typically behind the scenes, it's either Oracle database or DB2 database or SQL server, right? So you can then connect, you would set up a connection string with the IDs and passwords and URL. Think about it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know if yeah. you had to, like, obviously, technology. See, like, it didn't have to match it. I just see yeah. it. Yeah, you're going to load it up now. Probably what's going to happen is someone's going to give you a cut of data in a spreadsheet, almost 90% of the time. You know what I mean? You go and you get a cut of data and you can just upload that. And what happens is, I'm going to talk about when we get something. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, yeah. I was wondering uh, how about it works only on the English or different languages? How about some different font than like uh, Cyrillic? Is it uh, detect all different languages or only English? So, are you talking about social media or Watson Analytics? Watson. So Watson Analytics, we just launched um, Spanish. So the whole user interface, if you wanted to go into Spanish, you could do that. Um, that's the first other language we've done. For social media, as mentioned, we have seven languages that it pulls from, and we've just added two more, nine total. And is Mandarin included in that? Uh, it, I don't know which, I'd have to yeah. look up the email, yeah. but it, uh, there's a big, yeah, I'm almost. I just don't know which which yeah. version of it is. It is, but it all that ends up back in English, right? Right. right. And social so media it is it all back in English, native, so. but it goes back in the results being in English, right? right. Yeah. Um, yeah.
Any other questions while he's yeah. been there? <coughs> Could you see this being useful on your project? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's practically not about social media, but how, like, a lot of people not have to privacy, and they said they're upset. So this is, this, I'm going to kick this off. So what's going on is someone set this up, and it's pretty simple. I mean, you start out with a project, right? And then you come up with topics. So we were looking at I know why for December 7th, that happens to be Michigan State University. And then also, uh, these are trying to figure out the purpose of this. Yeah, helper. <laughs> and then um, also at the University of Washington, right? And then you can also put in their keywords as well. And this is important because you can get a lot of what we call a lot of noise. So you put in there those keywords and also more money to exclude keywords. I just did one for um, another university they're looking at their dorms. That's the sentiment around dorms and the movement they can, they kept getting this uh, you are gang Aaron Judge articles, so we had to exclude that out of there. But anyway, just so if you're thinking about using this for your project, just you know there's whole community to support you on how to use this, not only the class at IBM, but also the whole lots of analytics community, videos and resources. We'll go through that a little bit more again as well to help you get you started and use cases and how they work and things of that nature. So then, then you have your date range. And this happened in a very specific time period of the protests and the subsequent violent activity and what have you. So you narrowed it down to that and then we look with one language, so here we have seven. <coughs> right here. And what happened is someone else built this project, this is the whole sharing thing, and then they exported the, the metadata around it. Now I was able to import it into my project, if you will. So I didn't have to recreate it. And then the sources as well. So Twitter, forums, and what have you. So right now, this is only pulling 12,000 documents, which really isn't that much. I did one the other day, pulled 680,000 documents, which my, it was actually too much, so I went back and refined it down to around 40, 50,000 documents. Got real good insight. But after you're done, you know, setting up your topics, your themes, your dates, and you can do this over, it's an iterative process. You don't just do it once normally and just hit create that. It's telling you there's going to be about 12,000 documents. And now it's going to go out and grab that stuff. And we'll let this run in the background. Sometimes this can take two minutes, sometimes it can take 20 minutes. Depends on how many documents there are, how many people on the system, you know, everything, how fast your internet access it is, how many people on Facebook, it's blowing up because of the like, company from uh, customer. Is yes. it doing sweet spot for many documents? Or it no, I mean, just, just how, how much data do you want? I mean, that's your sweet spot, if you will. Yeah, we had, uh, just give you an idea, we had a healthcare provider that wanted to know like, hey, we run this report every year we publish. We really want to know what the sentiment is about it. Major, major provider. Well, we ran the project, and we ran it for like a year, and it only pulled up 200 documents. To me, I was scared to death. When I showed them, they were thrilled. Because within those 200 doc, you know, reviews and posts, they got a ton of great information. So the people posting, they had some like influential medical doctor that posts and talks about it. So. It, it really depends on the topic and, and, and the value. Yeah. How is the quality of the data determined? Well, we're going we're gonna to walk through that. We'll show you that thing. All right. So while this is when it's almost done, we're going to, that's right now while it's going. So this is going on in the background of the you know, this uh, session. And if you notice all those other things, this is something to be aware of too. As you open things and flip around, they stay open. So make sure I have some students like go oh, help them out. They got 50 things open. I'm like, oh, let's start shutting something. Just curious, um, do you know what the terms were that was linking Aaron Judge to the norms? Um, because it was uh, Maryland, and he went to this lacrosse school, and oh, okay. it was the same. He was from the same county that uh, these dorms were in. Okay. So we were able to look at the tweets and uh, the news articles. And figure all that the one we just said exclude Aaron Judge and Fulton Trump. So I guess it's pretty good news. Anyway. So I'm gonna close this site, close out. Things, and that's that thing. I'll leave the admissions dashboard open. You go back to the main screen. And then you can see I mean, the data tab. Just why I put it up. So I'm going to say uh, new data. You know what? I'm going to close this file. It may tell me it's being blocked. So student retention too. And uh, do a local file. Drag and drop. Just go browse. And uh, then we go to the desktop here. So. Here, I can 
upload multiple files at once. There is the capability to join tables on common columns and what they call refined data or massage data, if you will. You can certainly, that tool has that capability as well. So as soon as I hit import, what's going on, it's importing. It's pretty fast. Right? This isn't a big file, it's maybe 10,000 rows. So it uploaded the data into the cloud. It's secure, it's encrypted, and it's stored in the cloud. That's something key to remember. Sometimes you are working with company data, you're doing your practicums and what have you, and they have explicit rules about where the data goes and what have you. So just keep in mind it is in the cloud. It's also processing data. It's finding those correlations and patterns between those fields. It's building what we call natural hierarchy. So if you have like year, month, day, it'll build a hierarchy for you in the data, things of that nature. It'll build some calculations and you can see that in there, totals, summaries, averages, you know, basic statistics in there as well. And it also gives you that quality score on your data. So you can determine, gee, if it's, you know, some people have a threshold, like that sweet spot, it's almost 75%, 95%, whatever it is. And you can determine right then, do I need to go get more data, better data, or do I go ahead and do my analysis and then uh, don't trust it as much, you know what I'm saying, don't be as confident in how to get that. And I'll show you what it means. So when it comes to the data, so I can do things. And it's sometimes they're hard to see, but there's little, uh, I call them triple lists, lips. But then there's more options underneath that, right? Append data, refine it, that's like cleaning it up and things of that nature. So we can just pop that open. So a lot of times people will go into the data set and it's got like every state, right? It's just say right. And they don't want it. They only want to do analysis on California, Florida, Texas, or what have you. So they're going to refine the data, for instance, and maybe filter out the state, set a condition on there, right? Just filter out things. You can do that. With data. Whenever you start to do this, I always suggest keep a copy of the original data and name this as something else. Revise four states, whatever it is. That's a good practice. That way, if something messes up, you can go back to your original. And then uh, for the data metrics. Now, where does that score come up? It looks at things for like missing values, outliers, and skewness in there. Now, every column, and then it rates every column, right? So here we have medium, high, high, you medium, 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 what have you. And then that combined score gives you at 68%. So then you can say, oh, this one, you know, I'm trying to find a, uh, what do you call it, that column, local, like here. I can just decide to exclude that one take it out of there or not use it in the analysis if there's it's so it would low number of records and not approaching normal distribution be a reason to, to, to downgrade the quality yep. 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 yep yeah so that's that SPSS uh, we have a tool there's the data quality that's running in the background so that's what people are like why is this can I get this on prem or at my house you know what I mean Right now it's now. It's everything's in the cloud. There's so many moving parts behind the scenes going on that IBM manages that. New versions, fixes, patches, and things like that. They manage that behind the scenes for you, which is a good thing. So you don't have to worry about the software, you just worry about using it. Right? How are we doing on time? You're good. You have plenty of time. We'll be here till midnight. He said it, not me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> where am I? <laughs> Sorry. Out the refine. So you get the they want to understand that there's more steps you can do in here, build calculations, join fields together, concatenate. Since since uh, lots of is managing everything behind the scenes, and I know it is still secure, but it, do you ever have you ever had a security issue or anything at all? Even in, no. No? <laughs> Not honestly. IBM's been in the business of hosting data and right. software computers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, as long exactly. as they've been embedded, so we have some of the most secure sites. And there's a whole process. Yeah. We're certified HIPAA. We're HIPAA compliance. Bed RAM. Yeah. ISO 2000. It's all these certifications. Yeah. So this sits on SoftLayer, which is IBM's premier uh, cloud service, right? So our our customers are the federal IRS, obviously one that probably near and dear to your heart, uh, U.S. Army. So yeah, SoftLayer as a brand. Is, is rated one of the top, if not the top, secure uh, cloud environment. So, question? Yeah. yeah. So the intrusion detection and prevention type equipments are ahead of this in the sense that in the implementation architecture, you will see that like, all the things IBM evangelizes from a security standpoint and other, right? We are using them for the, so there is a, a well-guarded 
region before things can get in there. So you know, we are applying some of the things that are important with respect to uh, managing, monitoring, uh, intrusion detection, threat prevention, detection, in-flight security, like encryption, all those things are applied, right? So in the case, uh, that's one of the reasons why it's not wise to right away bring it in-house and all those are, are implemented on your side because some of these things are assumed and taken care of. If you're trying to mimic that, then you will have to do it yourself, and that's a big undertaking. One of the things we find in this class is we teach some other softwares, you know, ACL and some others that only that are not in the cloud and they only work on PCs, not on Apples, and you know, so being in right. the cloud really makes it great for the class too. You know, so. yeah. And I think the coolest part, well, I, in my opinion, when a customer, because we get that question a lot, is that's the benefit of working for IBM is because we work with 98% of Fortune 500 com companies. So when we go to be HIPAA compliant, we go to do all these things, we actually take a client through it with us. So like, you know, I know for a fact, Discover went through the process with us for security for a completely different brand that they're working with IBM on. Uh, so I think that's a huge benefit of somebody like an IBM, and I'm sure Microsoft probably does the same. Uh, pl having those people that you can walk through, clients that are willing to do that with you. So, I've uploaded the data, and now I'm just going to start exploring the data, right? So just by it being uploaded, it's come up with what we call these starting points. Just interesting things that's found in the data, if you will. Now I can start with those starting points. I can ask a question. Or I can say, you know what? I know exactly what I want to build. I want to build you know, a pie chart. So I can start immediately going, however I want to do this, whatever approach I want to take. For instance, you know, Telling me what are the values expected for your revenue by state. So right away I can tell just by looking at this, you know, the darker the shade is the more revenue by state. You know, I can filter and drill down. And maybe I just want to not necessarily by state, but by you know whether it's citizenship. Things of that nature. Yes, you know, so citizenship, no, things of that nature. So I can quickly change. side here, it's giving me what they call these discoveries. And these are just, once again, visualizations that is found, you know, put together for me. <coughs> Lowest total power, class hour by state has to be in Montana. What's going on with Montana? Maybe I need to look into that. Top four expected by apply by financial aid, AP test by city, state. Is this for one school or a comparison of a bunch of schools? This is, this is all these schools. You know, all of them. Yeah, Minnesota, New York, you know, that nature. These are, I'm sorry. So these are students. This is one school. One these school are school. students that are this is where school. The this is where they came them. from, and whether or not they were um, they call them out, retained or not. Okay. So, so we're not getting a lot of students from Montana. Maybe we want to be free from Montana. Maybe. Or a lot of students from Montana are not being retained, and we don't want to recruit them. Depends on what your objective is. So, yeah, so these discoveries, once again, I didn't ask it anything, it just came up with these things. So I wanted to drill into this and look at it a little more. Here my city. Maybe I don't like that visualization. I don't know how this is going to look. So just flip the switch. Once again, you're just doing data discovery. You might not necessarily like this visualization or this, this finding, so you just throw it away, as you said, right? But maybe like this one, you just rename it. And every time you rename these things, they get stored in a personal collection, if you will. So I'll just say uh, revenue by state. Then I can use them over and over again in other dashboards. I can start to analyze other sets of information. So here's the retention data. I don't want to do a comparison of the admissions data. Well, gee, we admitted these students. Now let's compare how what they retain, right? More importantly, let's look at the students that we were likely to reject when we accepted them. Are they retained now? Doing that side by side comparison and you know, correlation analysis or what have you, comparison. Uh, so, this is just one visualization, right? You know, go on and on. And every time I start to ask it a question, so if I go to new discovery or new 
the tab so I can ask you a question. Or a lot of people are thought, you know where to start. Well, it's a natural language, but then there's this what we call a helper, if you will. So what are you trying to do? You want to try to compare data, understand relationships, and that's my patterns. Where's the relationship between revenue and say um, states and gender? That's kind of a toggle switch and you can flip through the field, right? And here we've just got a breakdown and this tells you what kind of visualizations. This is a map, a tree map, a pack bubble, things of nature. Uh, so, uh, so here I can pull up this visualization, if you will. Maybe I don't like that once again, it's too busy, if you will, change it over. And it's actually making recommendations to based on the data type you're working with and all that. So here are the recommended visualizations. I don't like that either, right? Makes sense. So maybe I like this, maybe I don't. Combination charts. That might be a little more easy to digest. And of course you can do, I'm sorry, I'll have to formatting on this. I guess what's fascinating is if you were to go out and do a survey on a sample, we were talking about getting rid of samples and doing population-based population auditing. You're going to do a sample and then take Tableau or PowerPoint and start making slides up. I mean, it would take forever, you know, and, and you wouldn't have as good data as you're getting from this is, this is population based auditing. And then with Tableau, you're each going to have your own individual visual data. Tableau on this is that Tableau is biased, which means you are the one having a preconceived notion and then querying things. Here, the system is taking a look at the data and suggesting you, and know, based on that, you are evolving those like analysis and insights. Right? So it's a bit different compared to the Tableau approach. We do also do that, but then, but to begin with, if you have no idea what the data contains, this will be really helpful in basically honing, right? Like I'm very more to focus on. So here I'm just flipping through interesting things and how did um, before and this is my favorite button to undo. So before I had um, high school GPA compared by state, maybe okay now I want to look at how many students came in from visits, right? And correlate back to how many were retained. And you notice how he just dragged that up like that down on the bottom. That's all you got to do. So this is given what we call descriptive statistics. What happened? This, that, and the other. But now we want to try to understand why. Why is it happening? Right? That's what the predictive thing is. What's driving the retention? Right? What's driving the GPA? Low, high? Things like that. So I just go back. You know, I can, okay, so maybe I like this visualization. Once again, name it. You know, become in my own. I mean, you're asking a question and it gives you a suggestion, but 
How do you guard against the confirmative, conformative, uh, uh, confirmatory evidence? Because like, you might have like question, and you probably won't start to answer. And if you, depending on how you ask the question, it might give you right. like the answer that you want to hear. Right? Yep, that's what we call the bias. That's why yeah. there are ways to ask the question. In fact, there's a guide on what's and how to like when you use keywords like compare and relate and things of that nature. Hopefully, you'll stay in that within those guidelines that you go. The idea is you can make almost any tool if you come in with a bias and a predisposed notion of you'll make it show, right? What what you want it to show, tell that story just by creating measures, pulling out, filtering out data that doesn't you know agree with you, things of that nature. The idea behind this tool is you're not saying you can't do it this tool, it's a tool, but it's very hard <laughs> to try and do that. You're just asking a question that's coming back with the facts. Makes sense. <coughs> You can still create a biased um, viewpoint here, right? So there's sure. nothing preventing you. But then the idea is that, like, so this part is, let's say you, you came with an idea of what you want to ask, and you build a, uh, a visualization, right? Even if you didn't ask about it, you saw, you saw that on the right hand side, the discovery piece is about, like, hey, it looks like you are interested in this, but then I found some other patterns, right? So even if you have a biased viewpoint with this, the system will still take a look at and apply machine learning based on what you ask. <laughs> And then suggest some additional patterns is recognized, right? And then you can probe it, right? Things like that. Well, in the end, we have to make a decision. Oh, yeah, this is our ultimate right. decision. Yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, it's ultimately what we make a decision. Yes, yes, absolutely. It can help you reconfirm or it can help you find something. Yes. That's why I always kind of start out with that. Right. So there are new patterns and things yeah. that you might have not considered, right? Especially in social media and books and other extraneous inputs coming in, right, which you might not have considered, it will be very handy if you can see them when they come back. Wondering what, sir? How the IRS works in our way? Well, they're not roughly. She is a tax property. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're right. not they're not a root reference, so I can't really mention what they're using it for. Uh, but you can imagine. I mean, I would assume it's probably something around like detection, threat detection, or which, or which, say this without saying it, um, a smart way to decide which uh, which tax forms to pull to inspect, right? Who to audit. Who to audit, right. Which one further? Are we seeing a trend in all, in all the people that we're finding that we found guilty, right, and have assessed fines? Are we seeing a trend and pattern on what, whether it's the type of people, or it's the way they answer, or a certain filing that they include. Uh, those are things that somebody manually would have to go through. Uh, I'm not saying that was their use case, so don't get me in trouble. I'm just saying in the IRS world, that's probably something they would consider. But we just like, uh, you saw the tension of block, right? The tax season, so it's not just on the IRS side, we apply the same technology for the consumer side right. as well as this. So, it's an our block as a major uh, implementer of this, which can consume all the tax forms and then help you, like, how they like, maximize your tax returns, refunds, and things like that. Could be this technology, right? So, it's not just about auditing and finding that who should we go after, it's also about how do we get tax from the Yep. So both use cases. Yeah, so I was pulling up. That was a great partnership we introduced. H&R yeah. Block, do your taxes done by H&R Block? They took our Watson technology. So not this little slice of Watson, Watson Analytics. They took the Watson Cognitive, the one that you keep feeding it stuff, and it learns over time, competed on Jeopardy. Uh, it's a genius. And it said, all right, you can take it to a regular tax firm, and depending on the experience, that person probably knows a lot of the loopholes and all of these exemptions, all these great ways to give you a nice return, right? We're telling you, how about if we augment that person, not replace them, but we augment that person, and we have something like Watson that's been fed every single tax code and every revision and every new law. You know, I forgot what the number is, X number of millions of documents 
per minute that it's ingesting and learning, and then it augments what your tax advisor is telling you. That's a pretty darn cool way to ensure you're getting more money. So yeah, that is not block and scale everywhere. Right? Like they don't have the they don't need to have the tax expert and make it a control or change behavior. Does it have the ability if I had, for example, internal data on accounts payable or, or something? and I want to monitor on a continuous basis, and then I want to create alerts from it. Can I, can I put Watson's uh, engine into a work stream that allows me to follow up on, on, on you know, find continuously audit, basically, anomalies, and then follow up on them? That, that, that can be yeah. easily done. Yep, and then, yeah, these capabilities exist here in So while we were talking, <laughs> the data set from the social media um, tool finished, and it actually put together all kinds of what we call visualizations around topics, themes, sentiment, geography, sources, insights, authors, behavior, and demographics. Right. So if you, if you want to stop at the start at the top, you can actually see these are the actual uh, tweets, and peaks, and things of that nature, and valleys. Maybe we're going to concentrate on here. 950 on January 21st. Yeah. Actual now this is tied to the university thing still? Yes, this is the I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's Michigan, Michigan, State. State. Michigan State. They like to think it's not a Michigan State thing, but a Miro Geonopolis thing. So, but the idea is they want to understand how people felt about it, what are the comments on social media, and what more importantly, what can they do to mitigate this? And that was some type of protest or something. Yeah, so he's a very controversial right wing speaker. I mean, he came to speak on campus, and other people shut it down. So, so people who run the residence halls and the, and the cafeterias and the buildings, they were concerned, right? Is something going to happen there? Could there be uh, an accident? Could there be protests? You know, so they were trying to get a feel of <coughs> what the Senate so as we go along and look at themes, and these are all the things we put in there. We put in those keywords, the results of that, so it's a safety, that's a big one. So here's all the mentions. And once again, not everything is a hit, right? But here's UW protests. Questions on this again? 
Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm just making an assumption that like the, this is like what the government's utilized to like for terrorism. I mean, they're trying to keep up with things. That, yeah, yeah, they have tools like this, but usually they're a little more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they bring these tools, custom ones. You know, I'm sure we work with a lot of police departments who um, scan Facebook and all that. But, for, uh, but I will tell you, we we've had a lot of conversations as social media gets better. Uh, was we add partnerships we're seeing that so we talked to a partner a few weeks ago that was hot to trot but the one thing this was missing and, and uh, now they're helping us add is they wanted baltic languages because they were looking at terrorist threats and that didn't quite have that yet it's coming lithuanian's coming very soon uh so it's very interesting because a lot of our clients are shaping where this product goes um but to your point it did, where it's at today i don't know if it's as robust it'll give them the social listening and it'll give them the geography but there are some, I'm sure that we don't even know about, there are some threat detection tools out there for social media that are probably way more advanced than this. And so, so it did this analysis, it grabbed the 10,000 documents or however it is, um, and then also it created a data set for me. So once again, I can go back just to summarize, I can go back to this configuration and tweak it a little bit pull some things out of it, maybe add more context, things of that nature, and manipulate, rerun it again, if you will, or maybe save this data set as is and then create a new one. That makes sense. They can compare it to that potentially. And then also, like I mentioned, it actually creates a data set for me. So if I go back to my main screen and go to my data, right here, actually GNA 2017, kind of poor quality, and now I can start doing those visualizations right on that data. Well, uh, what is the number of author names by other countries? What is the relationship between the, the friends and the author names? You start to see the, how they interact with each other. Around. Is there a rule of thumb for data quality that is below 50% you don't use it? Yes, yeah, someone asked about the sweet spot. It's really up to you and your company. Like they say, whenever you run a model, if it's over 95% accurate, don't believe it. It's too, the data has been fitted, as they call it cleaned up so much that it's, it's really up to you what your sweet spot is and what your organization is. And then you can find, like, if you can go through the data and find those outliers or those fields that are completely blank and get rid of those because those cause your score to go down. Or you'd be like, oh, that's interesting. And there is blank data here. That's a problem with my system. You know, why is there blank on this? Well, we shouldn't be collecting it. Could be the main specific. Can you, like, like so the financial side would have perfect data, but anybody else, like, right? So CRM might not have that data quality compared to accounting, right? So right. things like that. So, so um, when, when they give you a suggestion, when the Watson gave you a suggestion, is there like a description of why they chose this set of suggestions? Because I think if we get it wrong, let's say like Watson get it wrong because of some reason, some like un unexpected event, we want to know why he got it wrong. And I think there's a value to why well, he got it wrong, right? There's nothing we need to esoteric question. There's nothing wrong with these data. Yeah, it's yeah, it's exactly. the data itself. Yeah. So if there's something wrong with it, it's your data. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And that goes back to that quality score. You could, there could be like some unexpected like events of some sort and in order to like really determine whether the whether, determine the quality of the prediction, um, if it gets it wrong, it would be nice to know why right. like they <coughs> picked the data like descriptions, you know? Like, why Plus. In this case, this is basically statistical analysis of the machine learning of the data. So it will actually, if you go, uh, you, can, you can see how we derive that conclusion. Let us say you have this prediction, right? Like which student uh, will drop out or something like that. Then you can see what algorithms were applied, what was the standard deviation, what was the coding. You will see all that the calculation behind. The next level is basically the cognitive reasoning aspect where Watson, I wouldn't call it a recommendation, Watson would say this is a hypothesis. Here is the evidence for the hypothesis. That's how it feels. So it's, a, it's still a human assist, right? So it's not just making decisions, but it is suggesting you, right? And so and that's where it will give you the evidence. And, and it will give you a rank or a score. So I'm 92% confident that this is what I should I would expect from this, something like that, right? And then it'll also give you 86% in all those, and you can take a look at all of them. And then you will make an informed decision on which one you pick, right? 
And you can actually see the statistical test. So if you click that plus button, Wes. Yeah. Right, so what I, when, I, when we started this in the beginning, if you guys remember, to kind of bring this home, the idea here is hundreds of people being able to do it that are not analytical. You have the test. So if 100 of us all here did some analytics and then we said, hey, we're going to go to the real smart guy. We're going to bring it to our data scientist, Wes. And I want him to run it under the big gun because I don't, I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not, Wes, but under this prediction, yeah. we purposely only built like six, six algorithms under the hood of this. And there's like 18 statistical tests that it did. We don't want this to be that extensive because we're not working with data scientists. Like I said, we're working with analysts. It's automatically doing that, but imagine the power of all of us now got some quick insights in the last hour, and we could go to the provost and say, look what we found. We looked at your data, and in an hour, this is what we found. Now, the guy that, that West guy, that data scientist, have him take all these insights, but these are all the predictive scores, here are all the tests, have him rerun these. Run this under something more rigorous like SPSS Modeler that has 45 algorithms. That's way more rigorous. And like I said, then validate our assumption or tell us we're full of crap. But at least you have somewhere to start. And that's what the power of this is. And like I said, in an hour, not even a half hour, we'd be able to do this. Versus weeks of somebody like Wes building a predictive model in a dungeon somewhere Typing away, maybe it's this, maybe it's the mashed potatoes that are cold. That's why people are dropping out. I mean, there are r ridiculous reasons that are out there today. If I can only show you some of the models that I have seen created by, by universities, you blow your mind. This helps it because it has data to back it up. Uh, to back it up. Mm -hmm. right, You're going to so show them the decision tree? Cool. Yeah, so I'm at the So we ran a quick predictive model for Identify the top drivers of retention versus the drive of memberships and housing to the right? So then we started drilling into it a little more. We started looking at, gee, what kind of club housing is there? Or kind of club membership versus housing? Like, say, theater, fraternity, sorority, off campus, on campus. Whether or not, how many clubs they want to, less than zero, less than two, two and above, things of that nature. And just from that information, we also drove towards the call decision tree as well. So here, whether or not they're being retained or not retained. So housing equals off campus, no club memberships, and if it's an infirmary, or infirmary versus greater than zero, so you have to be an infirmary, apply for financial aid, total class hours, less than 27. So now we have a profile of a student, potentially, that's likely to be 80% likely now we can identify those students, hopefully. And then we could also, like uh, Randy said, take it to a more sophisticated data modeling tool and run multiple algorithms across it, not just the six that are here. And somewhere you said you can see, where do you see the uh, algorithm? I think it's in the analysis side. In the analysis, like? The tab on the left. On the left, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. So that probably is a correlation. Yeah, with the statistical yeah. data is why yeah. the algorithm was used. Because you saw that like, you kind of found a pattern. Like, if you were coming in biased, you would have written a code like, if housing equal to off campus and club membership presented, you probably would have to come up with those conclusions that that probably affects the retention. Right? But instead, it applied a statistical algorithm and it says shape. Right? Uh, and then uh, as in group, it's called binning. Right? It puts them in some buckets. And then those are these buckets. So basically, on these buckets have 88 percent chance of uh, not retaining right? things like that. So it gives you the un underlying picture if you are interested to see how we came to that conclusion. So I can go along, do this all day, <laughs> and but you know some things I'll throw away, and some things I'll keep, right? Can you explain that chart real quick? That one, the yeah. circle, one. the spiral bullseye that? chart. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. You'll see this in the tool. The idea behind this is they call it a bullseye chart or a spiral chart. And the closer you get to the center, it's the more accurate it is. I can actually drill over each of these. So here we are, 87% strength that I talked about. You start to get like 95 and 98% accuracy. Something that they call it overfitting of the model or of the data. In other words, someone's cleaned it up so much. 
and now it's they've taken out all the stuff that could be important, if you will. So the closer you get to this, it's good sometimes, but you can also throw in there and look at things like you know, how the state impacted. But then the idea is I collect all these things together and I can put them together into a dashboard, right? Because this is one data source. I'm working with one file. I could be working with five or six data sources and finding insights across all of them. And now I want to put it together and tell a story to present that to someone. So the final stage would be uh, to go to display. And you saw an example of one, which you, know, you can get much more graphical on that with this one. But if I want to just go here and say you know, display, View display, and then we have there's a concept of a dashboard, which is a multi tab dashboard. Then there's an infographic, which is usually a long stream. It's good for you know telling a story. Usually, finance uses these infographics, but also maybe on a mobile device, you can scroll through a phone or an iPad with the infographic. And then this new concept of an expert storybook. And what that is, you put these visualizations together, you put animation on it, and like time on it put call outs on it. Like, look here, Michigan has the highest uh, rejection rate. Why is that? And next page flips over. Well, we've done some correlation and predictive model and seen that people from Michigan will study it. I'm not trying to match on Michigan, but um, the idea is you put that storybook together, it's animated, it moves over time, then someone can sit down and watch it or you present it at a conference or whatever like that. And then the person who's looking at it knows exactly where to look, where you want them to look if you will, know, because that bias thing Themes, you kind of call out something that is very animated and what have you. So the idea is I would just you know throw it quickly in first thing time and create here you get a template of you know to start with in the free form or you have a specific layout in mind and this is good if you're using like mobile devices and it'll shrink and you can do swiping. By the way there is an iPad app, a native app that you can manipulate the dashboard and do them and things of that nature. And if I go back to personal um, of course, I never put it in a folder. If you don't save it, that's another key thing. Make sure you do a file save as. Otherwise, it doesn't see it. Call the records. Also, important step. It'll actually make a PowerPoint slide for you, though. Yes. If you share it, it'll actually open up PowerPoint and create a slide. So here I'm in the dashboard. I want to interact with this visualization in real time. I just pull up my phone. Pull up like that. Make sense? Yeah. So that we're in the edit mode right now. Correct. Yep. Yeah, that's a good question. Let uh, me hit save. So I highly recommend save often in the cloud, you saw how it was spinning on me there for a while, and sometimes you'll lose a lot of work. I have a lot of things to get frustrated. Because they, and I'm like, well, when's the last time you saved? I'm like, oh, yesterday. Don't walk away from a project and not save it and close it and all that stuff. Because you're in the cloud, it'll get cut off. 
Um, so I say this for the two. And now I'm in edit mode, and if you do all the eyeglasses, this is quote unquote presentation mode. And that's another thing. People will be in edit mode, and they'll start sizing things and make them fit, and then they go to presentation mode. You know. And in presentation, there's a way to actually time it where you can set, there's like a little drag bar. And so if you want to show chart by chart, you can do that. So it's like a 15 second parameter, and you just set each of those, and it'll play like that as well. Uh, as we end, I just want to, just one kick, very important note for you guys. Not only in the classroom is it available at no cost to you guys, but there is a super extensive library of how to actually use this. So uh, we'll make sure that Laura sends you that library. It's a bunch of links. So we have a, uh, a YouTube channel of how-to videos. Uh, we have a step-by-step -step workbook, believe it or not, students created, which is awesome. Uh, tutorials, we have an online course. Uh, one side recommendation for you that I've the biggest trend right now in academia for students, we talk to every school, and we tell you is badging. So there is this online course. We have a thing called bigdatauniversity.com. There is a bunch of free online courses you can take there, and then you get an IBM certified badge. And that badging, they're calling these digital badges, people are putting on the resume. I, I just reviewed a resume the other day that actually had their badges from us, Oracle, Microsoft, um, there is an online course, it's Watson Analytics 101. You take that course, there's a little assessment at the end. Um, you do, do get an IBM badge. So I highly recommend the online course as well. Uh, and we'll get those all to the professor. Yeah, no, I have, I'm, I'm, I have that. They, you have I'm everything? That. In fact, we're Good. planning, I showed them this is the certificate, and I even passed this thing, so I didn't pass. But no, but it's a great <laughs> course. Good. So I, I was encouraging, and I think we talked about this, I, I, I'd like you guys to go ahead with what I put out on Blackboard and get your student access to Laura got Chris. Yep. And, uh, and if you have any trouble, let me know, or Fay or Laura know. And then I'd like you to start the class right away. I'm going to spend a little time in the next class. We'll go through an introduction. But it's as simple as what he showed you to go through. The only part is uh, before you take the test, because I, I, I told him that before you guys got here, that get that certification and put it on your resume. Yeah. When you go into, a lot of these folks are going into the firms. I wouldn't tell them I have lots of analytics certification. I'd like to use that. I want you guys to be advocates for using the software in the companies you go to and in the firms, because this is powerful. You know, and, uh, so, so go ahead and, st and get started on that. I'm going to give you some class time that we're going to work on, on, on using the tool, because I want to get hands on. The one caution I have is, Test questions are a little tricky. You know, it's which of these five things don't apply, and you know, and so so take some notes before you take the final test because you only get one shot. Well, you get two shots at it if it's multiple choice, and, and one if it's true and false. But you know, just 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 because I want you to get the certificate too, if you can in the class. I think yeah. that'd be great. Can I have just a quick question sure, about please. the accounts you set up for them. Who, who set up the accounts? Uh, or, my my, I have an admin that yeah. sets them up. We have an administrator. Okay, so you're gonna. If you haven't already, you get an email invite for that, right? Yeah. And what's activated now? Okay, don't set up your own account. Yeah. So my students, I had a big problem. I sent them the invites. Oh, really? They okay. went in there and said, oh, they set up their own new accounts and made that. The other thing you told me is you use your, your student ID. So yeah. You know, you're from a college. Yeah. Right, so we audit all the time because imagine who, doesn't want, who wants to pay for it, right? And we have thousands of paying customers. So uh, they audit the heck out of that system. So if you don't use your, your Rutgers email, they will delete. They will delete accounts. I've seen them do it. Yeah. Um, so we'll give you the free access. Yeah. We have no problem doing that. Just make sure you don't use your personal email. It makes you know if you haven't received your thing, you <laughs> your spam or junk mail, whatever folder. And don't sign up for your own account because then you're going to get the free edition. Whereas with the no, no, no. They have the, there's a student edition. Yeah. But I'm saying yeah. if they sign up on their oh yeah, yeah. Don't sign up for that. Yeah. So if, if you, you just out of curiosity. Yeah, if you're out of curiosity, go on WatsonAnalytics.com. There's going to be something flashing at you that says, get 30 days free. Don't do that. <laughs> there is a student edition you guys can get for five years. Yeah. You'll get more than 30, 30 days. You'll get five years. But again, cool Professor, you'll, you'll give them that link. Yeah, yeah I have, I've have provided that. Yeah. So let so me know the same problem. I, I already signed up with my personal email. Should I do it again? I I would if yeah, you're yeah, gonna no, do use the student one. Don't yeah. use your personal one. I would set up another one with your student. Otherwise, it's a whole different road. Yeah. Or you can actually change your profile. No. 
potentially change the profile in your watch analytics account from your personal email. Try that first. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. 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 What they're looking at in the audits, as you can imagine, it's automated and they're probably using Watson, but they're looking at email domain. That's, the, that's what I'm imagining.